Well, good day, everyone. It's Wesley Kia, part of the Co Starters team. And so we would like to welcome you to this special webinar we're doing tonight on uh, how to work through the Co Starters Business Canvas. So I'm joined by uh, Sabrina Nagel, who is um, Co Starters Extraordinaire uh, Facilitator from all the way from Auckland, New Zealand. So welcome, Sabrina. It's great to have you here. Oh, thank you. Uh, so our goal is uh, we're actually going to launch some of the Coast Artists courses here in Australia, but we thought we'd just do this quick introduction to the Coast Artists uh, business canvas so that you get an idea about what the course is based on. Um, you can apply it, start to apply it in your uh, your businesses and to your business ideas already. Um, and then we're going to talk about joining a course later on uh, as well. But uh, Sabrina, why don't you introduce yourself and you're going to have the joy of taking us through the canvas tonight. Sure, thank you. Yes, uh, I guess my passion is really at the intersection of, of entrepreneurship and educa education and so, sort of sustainability. And so I've spent the last 14 years working with lots of startups um, as part of incubators, as part of universities. Uh, I've launched my own startup, um, I've launched the primary school, which is quite unusual for a startup, um, and kind of um, helping my, my daughter launch on cookbook at the moment so there's always lots of projects going on uh, I love the space and I've also have lots of experience in terms of designing programs for different audiences so um, co-starters has been sort of a cornerstone program over the years and we just love it because it's all about building capability for entrepreneurs and it's all about giving you tools and building your network so that you can take this idea or any idea uh, through this sort of process going forward. So without further ado, let's launch into the Coast Others Canvas because we've only got an hour and I assume um, there's always lots of questions. So what I thought I'd do is I'll explain a little bit, set the scene, and then we kind of workshop our way through. So if you've got an idea, awesome. Let's apply it straight away. If you don't have an idea, just think of something like think of a wacky or I don't know something that comes to mind that you want to take through just for the practice or for the purpose of this exercise so we want to make it nice and interactive um so maybe uh, we've already we've already kind of done a little bit of a uh, workshop type um no I should say introduction from from you guys but I would love to know from Julian and Sheenie what is the one thing that you would like to get out of today tonight Um, I, I really just encountered this program very recently, so I, I, I'm um, still kind of kind of uh, getting my head around exactly what you what you're doing. It looks like a really clear kind of way of um, sort of summarizing um, some of the kind of key concerns when you're engaging in a startup, which is what I'm right in the middle of doing at the moment. So I think for me, it's just a little bit of um, clarity and, and 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 hopefully some insight that I can take to my own startup from from this. Nice, thanks, Julian. Appreciate it. Yeah, I think I looks this like last time with Wes, but it's kind of like refreshing. I just want like some, like get to know more as well. And I have like someone in mind as well, but I, because she doesn't speak English. So I was thinking like, oh, we're just going to have a look again and like what is all that. And then also like, you know, like fresher for me and also kind of like apply it and I guess like know more as well. Like, yeah. Okay, thank you, Shini. Well, uh, given that you kind of want to know a little bit about the context as well, where it sits, maybe um, I spent just a couple of minutes explaining a little bit on how we came across this canvas. So uh, working in the space, uh, I've spent, gosh, probably the last sort of eight years at a university here in, in Auckland, um, Auckland University of Technology, running this program called Co-Starters. And as part of my work there, I got to meet Wes and what he's doing in Australia. And we both really share um, our passion or love for this program because we were working with entrepreneurs who uh, often are either either at an early stage where they have an idea and not quite sure what they you know what to do with it how to get started or they have started a business but they're not quite sure something might not be working or they might not have quite all the answers or the you know foundations right um so there were sort of the people we we're working with and we were looking for a program or something to, to help them and so uh back about eight years ago uh, we did an extensive sort of 
um, scan of the environment. And this program is something that has come out of the United States, out of Chattanooga. And, you know, even though we love reinventing the wheel sometimes, Kiwis do. I don't know about Australians, but Kiwis do that. <laughs> We're like, this program is amazing because, um, you know, it really talks about or touches on all the foundations and um, it is about your own capability um, it takes the business jargon away it's very practical and so that's sort of wrapped up in a 10-week program so what we're going through tonight is sort of a quick overview of all of the areas as you can see on the screen here which is the canvas so this canvas is almost like your business model or your business plan but in one page so if you're trying to communicate what you're doing um, this is an ideal way of doing it. It's nice and visual, uh, but we also love about it. You can actually print it out. I've got one in my, my office door here that's like an A1 or something. And you can use posters on it. You can interactively work with it. As things change, you, you can change it um, rather than a business plan that gets outdated the minute that you finish writing it. So I think that's sort of why we like this as a framework and why we like the program so much. And so um, the 10 week program will go into more detail. It brings in guest speakers. So um, from week two to week nine, there's always entrepreneurs who share their own experiences. Uh, they make themselves available. You know, we have like a lawyer, an accountant, but we have also, um, you know, just entrepreneurs who've done it, been there, done that, share their learnings, their failures, which is really, really important. And uh, we, sort of finish the program off with a celebration so that's an, an I guess it's a bit of like a pitch event but it's not the serious sort of it's more of a um, opportunity for you to talk about what you've been working on in the 10 weeks and then um, applying this tool and uh, figure out where where the next stages for you are often we make this event uh, available to, to people in the wider network. So it's always uh, the, the group is, is a quite a small group, usually about, I would say, eight to 13 people, 14 people the max. Um, and the group can decide who gets invited to this, but it's really an opportunity to build your network and, and um, you know, get go to the next level. So that's sort of about the program where, where the sort of canvas sits as the integral tool. And so, yeah, I thought we'll, we'll go through it today. And um, yeah, as you have questions, interrupt, please. And otherwise, I'll stop every now and then. I'll give you some time to make some notes. So if you have got something to write, that would be ideally. Um, some posters, great. Otherwise, piece of paper is fine as well, pen. And um, yeah, let's get, go through it. Any questions? Or does that sound like a good idea for you? Cool, thumbs up, love it. Okay, okay. let's do that. So. Um, on the left hand side, up the top, you can see the customer. So when we talk about customer, it's really thinking about who is it that you're serving with it, your idea. And there's generally speaking, the thing that people jump to first, which is usually the easy thing, are things like the demographics. So, you know, okay, my customer are um, mothers who are, you know, between the ages of 30 and you know, 45, um, they're really busy. Um, oh, sh sorry, I shouldn't say very busy. No, they're, you know, they live in a medium to high income uh, sort of demographic. Um, they're, you know, uh, are well educated, those sort of things. That's sort of the first thing that we consider when looking at the customer. What are sort of the demographic characteristics that we can come up with? However, the thing that's more important that gives you a better insight into who the customer is are things like what are they thinking what are they feeling um, you know sort of more the characteristics that you sometimes can't quite you know it's harder to put your to, to your finger um on I guess and so in this case that I've in this example that I've just had might be that you know the mother is really busy the mother has um kind of two kids and now she enjoys sort of, uh, I don't know, healthy healthy living, but, you know, struggles uh, with a family or juggles a family and a job and, you know, all the sort of things. Um, therefore, you know, uh, she spends 
you know, 10 o'clock at night, she might, she might like finally sit down and, you know, kind of unwind a little bit. So sort of um, trying to get into, imagine you, yourself being, you know, um, the customer, get into the customer's sort of uh, shoes. So let's pause it there for a moment, take, pick up your pen and have a think about in terms of the idea that you have, or that you will just want to pick now for the, for the practice um, run through this canvas. Uh, write down who you think your customers, and I'll give you a minute or so. Just gonna make sure I time myself. Okay, another minute, and maybe I get one of you to share. So if you wanted to, you could use the chat or you can unmute yourself. Okay, I'll, I'll share because this is something new to me that come recently about like how to connect people with God intimately. So I feel like my customer will be the one that want to know how to connect with God and build memory with God encounter that able to sit down with with him and then like doing like a little bit activation in um like yeah not afraid to try like in like in the room and things and people that want to have connection with God when they're hopeless. Okay. Thank you. Does anyone have any comments or anything? Or Shini? Well, I like how you are focusing on the non-demographic characteristics, you know, the ones that are a little bit harder to figure out. So that's a very, very good start. Okay, let's go through our next. But, and as you can see, you know, we have to go through it and uh, fairly quickly, uh, given, given the time. But um, Kim and I love Owner, lovely to, lovely to have you here. So you just, um, you know, uh, pick up where, we, where we're up to. So we're now um, focusing on the top, the problem. So the problem is the problem that your customer has. So what is the problem that you're trying to solve for them? So... Oh, hi, Pete. Welcome, Pete. Um, so I guess uh, for you, most of you are probably trying to solve some sort of issue or problem. However, sometimes it might be an opportunity that you see. So Shini, maybe in your case, it could be a problem because there are people who are hopeless, you know, it could be a problem. But also it could be an opportunity. Um, you can, just, you know, flip it around and think about it. Okay, an opportunity for people that would like to engage with God and haven't feared previously. So that could be, um, you can phrase it either way. So if you can't think of it in a problem statement type of way, then think about the opportunity that you're trying to address with your product or service. Okay, so I'm going to be quiet and give you a couple of minutes. And then maybe we have someone else who would like to share.
Does anyone want to share what the problem or the opportunity is that you're addressing? Um, I'll jump in here. Awesome. Um, so I, I am um, creating an art storage business. So the problem that my customers have is they have um, high value artwork and they've got too much of it. They don't have enough walls to hang it on and they need somewhere to put it where it's going to be safe and secure and um, not at risk of damage from moisture or um, environmental conditions. Um, they don't necessarily want to give it to their family members because they might not look after it or recognize its value. Um, so um, yeah, that's that's the problem. That nice. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Julian. Very specific problem. Uh, and Super you niche. Know, so, yeah, yeah, very niche. And I guess um, you know, for, for a lot of businesses, when they've actually started a successful oh, sorry, that's my timer. Successful um, businesses, they often start with a very niche application because you can really um, be the expert or, you know, dominate that niche. And then often there's other similar applications that, you know, the solution that you come up with, you can then kind of expand or you can just, you know, if the niche is big enough globally, then you can just expand into different markets. So it's great. And um, I guess I'm also hearing that you probably have a background in art or in that space, in that industry. So again, that's really, you know, helpful. We always encourage people to do something in a space that they're knowledgeable of, that they have experience in. Um, awesome. So thank you. Great. So underneath, you see alternatives. And so when we talk about alternatives, these are really the alternatives your customer has currently. So at the moment, if they don't have your solution, what is it their customers are doing to solve that issue? So sometimes people talk about competition. And that's definitely, you know, competition or uh, alternatives. And so they, you can have direct competition or you can have indirect competition. So in, in Julian's case, direct competition would be if someone is actually already providing the storage solution in exactly the same way as, um, you know, Julian has described, that, that would be a sort of a direct competition and there would be an alternative. But at the moment, um, Julian has already mentioned it too, one alternative is for them to give it to their fam friends or family members, which is probably not the best idea, but, you know, it's an alternative because there's nothing else right now, maybe. So that, so kind of, um, it, it depends on your product or service in terms of how narrow or how wide you might want to define that, but have a think about, you know, both indirect and indirect alternatives or, or competition. So I'll, I'll be quiet for a few minutes and get you to make some notes. Does anyone want to share? Don't have to, just putting it out there. So this is usually how the program runs too. So we kind of take turns. Um, you know, the, the beauty about the program is that you'll be part of a, a group or a cohort of people and you'll be learning as much from each other as you learn through this process and as you learn from, from us because you know, we make sure that we have a very diverse group of people um, from different industries, from different backgrounds, working on, on different ideas. And you, know, you can hold yourself um, 
hold each other accountable. So that's sort of part of it as well. Every week, you know, we turn up at the same time. So the sessions are once a week. Um, we'll be running it online and we'll be running it um, in the evening, maybe not quite as late as this because it's sort of a two and a half hour session uh, every week. But uh, yeah, that's sort of what we're looking at doing. Okay, if no one wants to share, that's great as well. Let's have a look up the top, the solution. So what is actually the solution that you're providing for your customers? So what does he or she, they get from you? How are you solving that problem? And try to be, as this is why the box is nice and small, try to be succinct. So I don't want like half a page, I like one sentence. And I know we're doing this like, you know, really brush stroke sort of right now in an hour. Um, the more you spend time on this and working at more depth, you get more concise. But that's sort of the idea. I'll let you work on it and we wish you shortly. Does anyone want to share their solution? Um, I'll share. Um, for me, it's like the connection and hungry for more for God. Okay. And so I guess the next level would be figuring out what form that might take. You know, is that, um, you know, are you meeting with people? And if you're meeting, are you meeting with them in person, online, one-to-one, one-to-many, um, you know, or is it, if it's not sort of a meeting, is it, you know, some resources that you give them? Um, is it a program you take them through? Is it, you know, so kind of thinking about um, sort of the next level of detail, but it's a good start. Thank you, Shini. Okay, benefit. It's right at the heart of the canvas because that's really what your customer cares about. So that's, that are the things that they get out of engaging with your product or your service, having your solution. So these are often things that are intangible. So they might get faith, they might get hope, they might get status, they might get um, convenience. Um, I mean, again, it depends totally what your idea is, um, but it could be less of something or it could be more of something. So you might take stress away or you um, give them more convenience. So kind of thinking about, again, the two sides of the coin. Uh, but that's really, it's at the heart of the canvas because if you can't articulate the benefits well, then you don't really have a business. And so the difference between the heart of it, the benefit and the solution is that the solution are often tangible things. So you, they could also include, often include features. So if you think about a really simple example, like a car, the features of the solution would be the car, including, you know, um, an automatic door lock or automatic window openers and, you know, four wheels, four doors, a boot, you know, all of those sort of things. But the benefits would be a mode of transport, would be maybe a safe, you know, safety because it might be a highly, you know, um, safety rated car or um, it might be a status because it's a Porsche and it's all about, you know, showing off. Um, so I think this is the difference between solution and benefit that as you 
work more on your idea, it's really important to get clarity on those two. So I'll be quiet and let you figure out, write down a few benefits. Do we have anyone who would like to share or do we have any questions at this stage? Um, I'll jump in again, this one. Um, so the, the main benefits from the um, service that I'm creating is mostly less hassle um, for customers and, and lower risk, I think. Those are the two main things. There's a few other things as well. In terms of lower risk, as you mentioned, does it also have to do with, um, you know, risk of damaging it? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, so I mean, I, I guess a, a, a direct competition might be a, a, a regular kind of um, self storage unit that people would use for putting in their putting their furniture into storage or you know other household goods, um, but that's not something which is specifically designed for high value art. Yeah. Um, so there are other there are environmental risks in those kinds of environments that in those kinds of um, competitors mm -hmm. that, that you know a, a mm. purpose built facility wouldn't have. So that's a lower risk. And I think that's a, a really good one to sort of articulate in the benefit as it's almost like it's a a custom made solution or um, you know as you said it's not just storing anything but there's some really specific things that need to be taken into consideration when, when storing art so that's mm -hmm. something that you know is, is definitely a benefit as sort of your yeah um oh we'll come to that in a moment okay no i'll pause it here great thank you so next underneath you see the advantage and the advantage is really the advantage that you have over other people in this space and so even um, for some of you, you might, um, you know, if you have more of a social cause that you are uh, pursuing, then you might, you know, not necessarily think about other people as competition. However, you still have to be really clear around, you know, um, I guess winning the trust of people that want to work with you. And so, you need to convince them why is it that they should work with you and with your service or your solution. So what is it that gives you the edge over others? And so it could be things like, Julian, like uh, in your case, you know, of the storage units and whatever that, that you, you know, have um, the experience and the expertise, first of all, in this field, but also to come up with a solution that, that's, you know, very specific and customized to storing art. So um, that's an advantage. Another advantage could be, um, I guess, more broadly independent from what your ideas could be. You might have networks that others don't have. You might have access to capital. You might have expert, access to expertise. Uh, you might have, oh, what else can you think of? What else could be an advantage? Um, I mean, sometimes it could be literally that you're your own first customer as well. I mean, it could be a huge advantage because you know exactly what it feels like, the pain points that people go through. So often it is actually a combination. It's not just one thing. It's a combination of a few different things. So you want to make a few notes and I'll give you some time.
Okay, does anyone want to share the advantages that you've noted down? Giving someone the chance who hasn't shared yet, maybe, if you're up for it, Kim or Pete or Fabian. Also, no pressure. Oh, it's Pete here. I'm, I'm probably in the wrong place. So I'm not involved in business at all. I'm um, completely now a street evangelist. So um, it's not a business. It's completely um, um, spirit-led and you know, being faithful to God you know, each day and um, that's that's about as much as I know. <laughs> no, that's 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 good. And you know, um, I guess the concepts that we're talking about, you can still kind of apply them in your context, I, I think, because even though it's not a business as such, as I said, you're still, you know, if you want to, I guess sort of make it something sustainable for you that you want to pursue and kind of spread the word or increase your reach or whatever. Um, I would assume that, you know, going through this exercise could still kind of help you clarify your thinking and figure out how you might want to take it to the next level. Uh, no, um, God's doing all that for me. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the Lord's organizing the publicity. Um, People come to me and take photos and selfies and uh, <laughs> okay. Except uh, oh, then you're very unique in that way. That's a blessing too, isn't it? <laughs> well, um, yes, yes. I'm quite, very privileged, I believe. And uh, if I'm faithful with little, the Lord adds to it. Awesome. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you still for joining us, and hopefully there's something helpful still for you and in, in that. Oh, I, I won't stay. I, I just got the um, invite in the mail this morning and um, I just came here. To so check what, it out. See what's cooking. Great. And, well, thank uh, you. Thank you for joining. <laughs> uh, pleasure. Uh, where are you sitting, Sabrina? Uh, I'm in Auckland, New Zealand. Oh, so you've lived in um, South Africa as well? Uh, no, I'm from Germany originally, so you picked up the accent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Yes. Okay. Well, I might sign off, but thanks. For okay. Your Thank you so much. Thank you, Wes. All right. Cheerio. Have a look what else we've got on. So up on the um, top right, up the top, we have the message. So from that point of view, it's really thinking about what is the message that you would like to communicate to your customers. And the message is usually twofold. So this actually the actual words that you're communicating, but it's also how do those words reach your customers? So um, in terms of that first part, it really helps uh, customers to sort of connect with, with your story. So what is your story? Why, you know, what are you trying to communicate? Why are you doing it? What kind of packaging that up? And then the second part is, you know, how do you how do you spread spread that message? And so that could be that you doing it through word of mouth and referrals. It could be that you've got a website and um, you know people read up about it. It could be that you're doing advertising. Maybe you're doing a combination of those things. But really thinking about, you know, how do people actually find out about you? I mean, it's great that you're doing this, but <laughs> you kind of need to make sure people become aware of you as well. Maybe you're partnering with people and then it's sort of referrals and um, you know, in your case, Julian, I'm thinking. Uh, it might be, you know, could be partnering with galleries or with people who, who teach artists or maybe, um, yeah, I'm not sure, but I didn't think about that. So I'll be quiet for a little bit and give you a chance to make some notes.
Okay. Any thoughts, any questions, any comments around the message? Um, so when you, Sabrina, when you talk about the sort of the message, is this is this kind of like a like a brand statement or a kind of a marketing kind of language? Yes. Yep. Yep. Very good question. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in in my case, I would, um, you know, the the message really is around making storing high value art um, nice. easy and relatively risk free. I mean, nothing is ever without risk completely, but risk yeah, free as much as we can come to. No, that's great. It's nice yeah. and concise. So usually, a message, a good, a well crafted message, and I think you're you're kind of really hitting a lot of those points already, Julian, is when you talk about sort of what it is for whom. So in mm -hmm. your statement, you kind of, you know, implying it's for artists because who else would store? Well, maybe it's not just for artists, I guess. It could be. Mostly collectors people, actually artists. It could be, exactly, right. it could be really rich people who've got lots of art and they don't have enough wall space. Yeah. But generally speaking, it might be, um, you know, artists. Um, and so you're talking about, you know, what you're doing for whom, for, you know, the, the problem that you're solving um, mm. and um, for whom. So that that's great. And how you're doing it, you know, and, and you also put the benefits in there, which is amazing. So if you can all put that in to one sort of statement, then what you've done is you, you hit all the important things. And if someone only has got a really short interest span, you know, they've got the essence of it straight away. And then they can kind of, if they're interested, they're like, okay, well, now what's next okay then you have a call to action um where you drive people oh here's my business card or check out my website or you know we might have an ad and a click here so yeah great awesome okay underneath we have the distribution so this is you thinking about how does your product or service actually get to customers so it could be there's two ways generally that's indirect and direct so indirect would be if you've got a product, uh, you could indirectly sell it through department stores or supermarkets or online retailers. Uh, you could directly sell it through your own website. Uh, often people might do both um, and that's fine as well. So it's just thinking about, I guess, it's not necessarily what's easy for you, but it's thinking again about the customer. That's why, you know, we generally speaking focus on the, or, or start with the customer really getting a good sense about, you know, who, who this person is, because you want to figure out what works for that, that customer. So maybe in Sheenie's case, you know, um, she might find out that it is actually people wanting that face to face. So if that's important to a customer, then, you know, there's no good having anything online because, you know, just because it's convenient for Sheenie. Um, so I think that's sort of something to keep in mind. The distribution needs to work for your customer. Okay, I'll give you a few minutes, one minute or so. Okay, any thoughts on distribution? I just have a question with this one. So I think like, can distribution be flexible because then that will be according to how it works for them as well? Or is it actually they have to adjust with what I just noted? Mm, yeah, that's a very good question. I guess because you're in a, in a service-based business, um, I would think, 
uh, in your case, it could definitely be flexible because you yeah. might have slightly yeah. different customers. Yeah. And then, you know, you might the every different customer might have a different way of interacting with you. Okay. Whereas if you had a product, yeah. you would probably want to make sure you've got one way of distribute or, you know, a couple of ways. You know, you might do... Uh, if you're publishing a book, you might do, you know, indirect through Amazon, and then you might do directly through your own website. But you wouldn't want to change the distribution method every time you're sending out a book because it would, you know, not be, um, yeah, worthwhile for you. But yeah. in a service-based business, that could could definitely be. But I would assume that you probably, in time, you'll probably figure out on the left-hand side that you have more customers than one. And it's it's quite... Uh, normal to have more than one customer so what we always say is we encourage you to focus on the customer that has the biggest need first mm. and it's generally speaking you know a type of person so in your case it might be people who are completely hopeless and they're you know just looking for some answers and they're looking for for something and therefore you focus on those first but there might also be other customers that that you um, can think of Sometimes it's also the customer and the user might not be the same. So very easy example, if you're making children's toys, you know, the user would be the child and the customer is, you know, caregivers, parents, grandparents, whoever. So that can also happen. And just to keep something in mind, especially with sort of social causes as well, uh, often people paying for it are not necessarily the people who are um, reaping the benefits or, or using the service as well. Um, I guess one thing I didn't mention earlier, the whole idea about starting or doing this canvas is when, you, when you're an entrepreneur or someone who wants to start a business, You've got all these ideas in your head. It's really important as a first step to actually get these thought, thoughts from your head onto paper. So that's what we're doing here. Um, a first goal at consolidating your thoughts. And so the next step, which is actually the more important step and the trickier part of the step, is you put all the assumption on the, on the canvas and then it's about validating those assumptions. So that means that you actually have to figure out people who represent your customer profile and start having conversations with them and listening, you know, finding out, do they actually have a problem? And, you know, if they have a problem, what are their alternatives? And sort of really learning from those insights and trying to validate every single assumption on this, in this canvas. And sometimes they don't light up. Sometimes you find out, find out something from potential customers and you're like, oh, okay. I didn't know that. Uh, that's a different way of, you know, distributing my product, product or um, my service. So I guess um, it, it de-risks it for you. That's the whole idea. And this is, this is something called market validation or customer validation. It's sort of the term that in the startup world uh, people often use. And sort of that's uh, why, we're, why we're doing the canvas as well as sort of getting the ideas from your head out and then going the next level. Because we've worked with entrepreneurs who haven't done this and they had this brilliant idea. They come up, you know, uh, a guy that, you know, came up with this idea for a software for real estate agents and spent $50,000 remortgaging his house, you know, building the software, got, got it built because he wasn't a software developer. And um, then figured out when he was launching it, not enough people were buying it, a few people were interested and that was it. And hit a wall and figured out that actually, People didn't want, you know, I think he came up with a software or with a website, I can't remember. And by talking to them, they wanted something completely different. But he had already spent $50,000 investing in the solution. And so, you know, we want to prevent that. We want to keep you nice and lean and agile and res um, responding to things. Okay. On the right-hand side, the very important part is revenue. So it's a fancy word of how you're making money. And even if you're in a so if you've got a social cause or an idea that's based around that, you still have to somehow, unfortunately, our capitalist society is measured in monetary terms. That's how the world works. And so somehow you have to figure out how this this idea can become sustainable. And so how can you make money? And so it could be 
things like a one-off purchase. Uh, it could be things like, you know, when you think of Netflix or Pandora, it could be a subscription. It could be that people donate. It could be that people um, lease something of you, you know, so there could be all sorts of different ways. And again, it could be a combination too. So often, you know, if you have subscription models, they have the, the monthly one you can pay by month or you can actually pay a whole year up front and you get a discount. So again, you know, one doesn't necessarily exclude the other way that you're getting paid, but you have to think about how you're going to get paid and what are you going to get paid? Um, and so, yeah, thinking, uh, I guess there's lots of different things that go into price pricing and we can't go into those sort of details right now, but you know, you hopefully have got a bit of an idea based on your own experience and your and your research that you've done yourself on a number or a way that you can get paid. So I'll, I'll be quiet for a few moments and get you to make some notes. Do we have any questions or comments on that one? Someone share. Okay, that's fine. We have two more boxes to go. So right at the bottom of the canvas, making up the foundations, are two things that are also related to the finances. And these are the startup needs on the left-hand side and ongoing costs. And so in order to figure out whether your model is going to be sustainable, you need to figure out how much it's going to cost you. So on the right-hand side, now let's start on the left-hand side actually, startup needs are the one-off things that you need in order to get started or to serve your first customer. That's why, um, oh, sorry. And there could it could be things like money, it could be people, it could be special equipment, it could be um, expertise, yeah, my, um, people. It could be a, a combination of those. So I don't know, Julian, you might need, I don't know, special, a special sensor on your <laughs> on your you know special technology that there's a sensor that keeps the humidity and the and the temperature constant I'm not sure you know um you might need something like that um might be sometimes you need to actually get some expertise in because you don't have you know the the team yourself yet to get get started so you might need someone to make a website for you or whatever. So the reason why there's the sign coming soon is literally all of the things that you need to get started. And the reason why we're distinguishing them from the ongoing costs on the right is because often when there's like one of things, you might be able to get creative around those. So let's say there's a piece of technology that you need to acquire um, and, you know, there might be a way to, to start off with, you might be able to, to lease it or um, license it somehow or, you know, get creative around that. Um, if you need a special piece of equipment, um, you might be able to, you know, borrow it from somewhere or, or uh, you might be able to, if you need expertise, you need an accountant to run some numbers or whatever, you might have a friend that can do something and then, you know, you can do something for him in return or her in return. So often with those startup needs, you can get creative with and that's okay because they're one-off things 
you wouldn't want to rely on something like that on favors or things of people you know on an ongoing basis so on the right hand side these are the costs that are ongoing so anything they keep you going that's essential or I guess non-essential but you probably want to focus on the essential things first and again they could be a combination of uh, money people things technologies uh, and you would want to make sure that you understand those things and then figure out whether you know with the money coming in and the money going out whether it makes sense Okay, so I'm going to pause there. I see that, Julie, you've unmuted yourself. Did you have a comment or a question? Oh, no, sorry. I just left my... Um, I've got to mute myself again after our last... No, question. okay. No worries. No worries. Mm -hmm. So I'll um, get you to yeah, make some notes, and then we've got some more time for questions. Okay. Any comments, any questions about what we've just gone through? Um, thanks, Sabrina. Um, it's it's quite useful, this kind of, because it's quite, it's really concise. You kind of just drill down into the, the, the nuts and bolts of um, of a business plan without getting to I don't know for me I've I've spent a lot of time on business plans and and this just kind of like really just distills it down to the essentials which is great nice thanks for that feedback mm. and I guess what you'll figure out as well as as soon as you change one of these boxes it usually affects at least another box as well so you know if you feel like you know, starting with one particular customer segment. And then you, you know, as you're talking to customers, you figure out something says, oh, have you actually thought about this application? You know, it could be really useful for these type of people. And then like, oh, okay. So then you've got another customer, but they probably have different alternatives. They want a different message. Maybe they even want a different way of getting the product or service. And, you know, so um, yeah, that's, it's quite interesting to kind of always keep that in mind. And that's why, you know, we keep it nice and interactive. Uh, use post-its if you've got different customers you can use different colored post-its and you sort of you know or you can do a different canvas for each customer whatever whatever works for you but yeah uh, I think that's definitely one of the advantages Julian is around making it con concise becoming quite specific in, in certain things that you know specific enough so you can test them too because I think that's that's the whole idea and um you know if you're going through and you know, co studies is obviously not the only program that does this. This is a sort of tested methodology, lean startup methodology. A lot of programs do that. Um, but in a good program, and, and co studies does this really well, there's a big focus on, on validating those assumptions and figuring out how, how is it actually then that you can test those assumptions now, how you're going to have those conversations with customers, you know, without pushing your solution and being told what you want to hear <laughs> because people want to please you and sort of you know, um, yeah, getting those insights that you need to figure out how you make this work. Yeah, no, Serena, this is a really good and I think the challenge, like it's like start up me at the cost. Like at the moment, it's like face to face is free. People already there. I think it's just sort of mass. So I just like, well, this is uh, difficult to answer this one. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, obviously we've also given you a lot of information in a short time. So often um, 
the brain needs some time to digest and, and sort of go into the subconscious and then making connections, you know, probably overnight or then, you know, when you wake up in the morning, you're like, oh, I wonder if that's another way as well. And also every time you talk to someone uh, about what you're doing, you'll, you'll probably get a different take and then, you know, kind of bringing it back and distilling it back and, and seeing how that fits in with what you've, what you've put on your canvas can be really helpful as well. Mm. It's good. It's been really excellent, Sabrina. Thank you so much for taking us through that. Has Has anyone else got any final questions, Kim or Fabian? Um, is there anything you want to ask? Oh, uh, yeah, no, no questions for me. Been very educational. No, no worries, thank you. No, no questions for me either. So it's really good material. Just a matter of sitting together and explore a bit more on each area each area and yeah expand according to our needs and trying to find out all of these things in more and more yes. deeper nice well glad that it can be helpful sort of part of you know sometimes it just takes something like that to get you going that's good so um kim and fabian we've arranged for another one-on-one -on -one meeting so i'll do that we can discuss this further and Shani and Fabian, I'll reach out to you as well. Um, so the other thing that we are um, we are going to start a co-status course again up in Australia. It's been a while since we've done that. So I'll reach out to you about that. And for those that are watching the recording of this, because we know there was quite a few others who registered, um, that we can reach out to you and have a discussion about that as well. Sabrina, you've run a numerous number of co-status courses now. What, what do you think is the the benefit that you see that people get out of the course the most? I think the biggest thing is around sort of the accountability and being part of a community of people because, I mean, all this content somehow you can get online, you know, and, and some people, you know, are very self-disciplined and for them it works and they kind of just do it in their own time. But often what we find is people need some sort of momentum and, you know, starting a business is, is pretty hard. I mean, it's super rewarding, but it's also very, very hard. And so if you're already kind of struggling to get it off the ground, then you might actually not really give it the best shot that it deserves. So I guess, you know, being part of a program allows you to connect with others and to build your support network, to build your network um, and kind of grow it to the next level. So it's sort of a combination of the content is one thing, but as I said, you know, I mean, this is brilliant content, but there's also lots of brilliant content um, out, out there. Uh, and then the combination of building your networks, building your skill sets and it, um, yeah, and having the opportunity to kind of bring it all together at the end where it's really about getting feedback from people from the wider community. So, you know, um, getting getting people who might be potential advisors, getting people who are potential, um, maybe even investors at a later stage, uh, just people who are keen at helping startups grow. Um, they often come to sort of, you know, our, our celebration nights or celebration evenings where people are presenting. And um, yeah, and then, being able to 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 practice your presentation skills. I mean, that's a whole different ball game. And you know, people actually feared more than death. I didn't know. I, I don't know if you guys knew that, but <laughs> it is the number one fear in the world. And um, for a lot of people, it's not it's not easy. So there's also an aspect, uh, you know, that we help you sort of go through every week and build your confidence in order to articulate what you're doing. And then we have a presentation, a uh, practice, um, you know, presentation the, the week before the actual thing as well. So that's sort of taken care of. Yeah, that's sort of in a nutshell, I guess. But yeah, Julian, I mean, I know you in Auckland, um, you know, even if, if this is something that's of interest, just stay in touch because when we, we're not making it just, um, you know, open to Australians and we'll have an Australian and a, and a Kiwi presenter. So it, it, it's definitely relevant for for people from both from both uh, countries or cultures, and um, yeah, as long as the time fits, I think the time will be more like a five thirty ish um, for Australia, so seven thirty fast. But yeah, that's sort of what we're what we're looking at getting kicked off. I think next week, right, Wes? Yeah, 
this week. Yeah. That's the plan. If yeah. we can. Get, get Next week or the week yeah. after, we'll you know we'll make it we'll, very soon. So that's sort of the plan. But yeah, um, lovely to to meet you, even though it was briefly, and love the interaction. Thank you, Julian and Chini. Uh, that was great, and I hope you got value out of it. Wherever the, your path takes you next. Ah, very good. Thanks, Julian. You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, that's good well thank you guys i'll be in touch with each one of you and um for those who are watching this recording afterwards i'll be in touch with you guys uh as well but thank you we're right on we're just after eight so we'll finish off now because we want to uh keep to the time limit but thank you so much and we look forward to uh connecting with you in the future good night see you